Well, with that prayer in our heart, let's have our Bible in our hands this morning and open them, please, to the book of Proverbs, to the book of Proverbs. We've been digging in this gold mine of truth about which the choir has sung today, the truths of the Word of God, specifically found in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs says that wisdom is crying out in the streets and in the paths of life, calling people to the way of God and the wisdom of God. And so we're in this series that I've entitled Street Smarts, how, how we need the wisdom of God for the life that we live out in the streets of life. And uh, we're reminded from our memory verse, Proverbs 2, 6, that, that the Lord gives this wisdom and that from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So let's just say that together. Our memory verse, Proverbs 2, 6, let's say it together. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding, Proverbs 2 and verse 6. Now, the Proverbs were either written by, composed by, or collected by King Solomon. King Solomon, the Bible tells us, was uh, one of the wisest men in the history of the world. And in fact, we're told that kings would send their wise men to, to sit at the feet of Solomon and learn his wisdom. Now, you may know if you've read your Bible that uh, Solomon didn't, uh, didn't always uh, live up to his own advice. And in fact, at the end of his life, he turned away from the Lord and, and died a disillusioned man. But that's okay because we know that we don't look to a human being for the wisdom that we need, that this wisdom comes from God. And in fact, we're told in the scriptures that the word of God, the wisdom of God became flesh and dwelled among us. And so the Lord Jesus Christ came and embodied for us all of the wisdom that we need in life. So we don't look to Solomon. We look to Jesus. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 12, 42, that the queen of the south came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. Amen? Aren't we grateful that we have embodied in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ all of this wisdom so that if we want wisdom, we need Jesus. If we want our life to be right, we need to be right with Jesus. Now, let's turn specifically to Proverbs 22, 6. Kevin mentioned uh, this uh, passage of Scripture a little bit earlier. Proverbs 22, 6, God's Word has uh, wisdom for every imaginable sphere of life, including our family life and how we're supposed to raise our kids. Uh, Proverbs 22, 6 may be one of the most familiar verses in the Bible when it comes to parenting. And so you may remember these words when it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old... He will not turn from it. I don't know about you, but I am, I am particularly troubled at the world that our children and grandchildren are going to live out their lives. Just this past week, we saw it right here in our own city when the Fort Worth ISD administration handed down policies related to that reinforced a transgender lifestyle for children and teens. And I'm telling you, church, we, um, I, I just don't know how much further we can sink as a nation when we are absolutely denying the very creation of God, that he in the beginning made them male and female. And so what is happening is that that through the policies of our government that we're undermining the very truth of God. And so one of the things we have to do is to make sure we protect our children, all of our children. And, uh, and, and by the way, we're going to be sending out something this week that uh, will help you know perhaps how to respond uh, to uh, the Fort Worth ISD and even to our own president who's handing down regulations that have to be adhered to by the school districts. And we need to speak up about that in preservation of our religious freedoms, but also in protecting our children from this perversion of God's good creation. But we have to do more than that. 
We, we have to raise up children, train up children who will be strong in the Lord, who will be leaders, who will take the gospel to, to our sin-saturated culture that will, will become increasingly so, and that they will be strong enough to stand against the tide of pervasive evil that they're going to face, church. We're going to have to raise up young people who will be able to stand strong against that tide. And Proverbs 22, 6 shows us how to do that. It tells us that we're to train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. I realized this morning that uh, not all of you are parents or grandparents. Some of you are married, and you hope to have children someday, and if so, what we, what we have dis- discovered today in the Word of God will help you to begin to think about the kind of parent you want to be if the Lord Uh, wills to give you children. Many of you are single adults. Maybe you hope to be married one day and have children, so you'll take notes today uh, about how you want to raise the children that the Lord may give to you. Or perhaps it will help you to appreciate as a single adult what your parents did for you. The very fact that you are here today probably means that uh, your parents honored some of the principles that we're going to find here in the Word of God. I want you to see, first of all, there's a command The command here is train up a child. We don't let them just grow up. We we train them up. Now, that word train is is typically not what we take it to mean. The word actually means to dedicate something or someone, to start something or someone off on a particular path. If you watched the uh, Kentucky Derby a couple of weeks ago, uh, you noticed that the jockeys would walk there their uh, horses around the track, and when it came time for the race to start, they moved them into the starting gate. And in moving them into the starting gate, what they're doing is that they're narrowing, they're, they're hedging this horse into a particular place so that it, gets, it, it starts off at the right time and in the right direction. That's, that's the picture of this word, train. It is helping our children get focused early in life on the path that God has for them. We want to channel them into the way of the wisdom of God. Train up a child. That's the command. And then we have the course. The course. Train up a child in the way he or she should go. So this is the path. This is the way. This is the road that God has for them to take. And generally speaking... This way of the Lord is the way of righteousness, it's the way of wisdom, it's the way of the fear of the Lord. It is the way they are to go. The only other option is for them to go a way that leads to destruction. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. And we want to do everything we can to uh, steer our children away from that dangerous path. It's the path that Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, when he said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and and many enter through it. So it's the way that most people end up going. But small is the gate and narrow is that road that leads to life and only a few find it. So as parents, We have to use every tool at our disposal to help our children get started on dedicating them to that narrow way that Jesus has marked out. The verse literally says, train up a child in his way, in the child's way. And I take that to mean that God has a unique plan for every child's life. But generally that plan is is in the broad boundaries of his will for their lives. So within that, we want to help them discover the unique thing that God is calling them to do, but always to walk in the ways of the Lord. But there's a huge challenge that we face in parenting. And you discover this from the very earliest days of raising children. That is, children are sinners, just like we are as parents. Proverbs 22 and verse 15 says that folly, sinful foolishness, is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from them. 
So the fact is that left to, to our own way, left to our own choices, that we will typically choose the, the broad way that, uh, of, of unrighteousness rather than the narrow way of righteousness. We will, we will choose the easy path of godlessness rather than the hard path of godliness. That's, that's our problem as, as sinners. And that's why it is necessary for us to exercise what I'll call gospel parenting, gospel-centered parenting. That is that we understand at the very heart that we are dealing with a spiritual issue in the hearts of our kids. It's the same spiritual issue that we all face that has to be overcome and can only be overcome by God's work of Jesus hanging on the cross of Calvary, paying for our sin in order to deliver us from the the, the chains of sin and the, the penalty of sin. And so what happens is that when we put our trust in Christ, we help our children understand that, then they are transformed from the inside out. Otherwise, the task of parenting is almost impossible if we cannot come to grips with the need for them to hear the gospel. So the parent's greatest and most urgent assignment is to lead their children to Christ, to lead them to repent of their sins, to lead them to put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, who alone can save them and who alone can give them a new heart. So there's the command, there's the course, and then also there's the consequence. The consequence, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. He will not turn from it. Now here's the principle. When you train up a child in the way they should go, What you're doing is that you're setting them in the direction of God's will and God's way. And when you do that, when you do everything at your disposal to get them on that right path, starting off, then they have the best shot at staying on that path throughout their life. There may be times that they stray, but they will come back. They have the best chance to find their place in the will of God for their lives. Now, I say the best shot, the best chance. Why? Because this doesn't offer any guarantees that your children will grow up the way you want them to. You see, this proverb is spoken to parents. The flip side of the coin is the choice and the consequence of children making their own decisions. All we can do as parents is to do our best to train them up in the way they should go and trust God that he will work on the other side of the coin in their hearts. But there's no guarantees. In fact, parents read this passage of Scripture, this verse sometimes, and they just feel crushed by it. Because they have done their best to try to raise their children in the way that God would have them go. Only to find out when they are old, they did depart from it. That they strayed from it. And we read a passage of scripture like this and we feel guilty. What did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong that my child made a choice to take a different path than I taught them to take? Well, I want to tell you today, friends, that all we can do is what we can do as parents, and then we have to pray for them and trust that God can can turn them around. If they strayed from the path they should go, that God can bring them back. So I'm going to show you this morning from the Proverbs and other passages of Scripture some street smarts for parenting, for raising children who who will stay on the path that God has for them. And I want you to think about it in terms of building blocks. Um, Lego building blocks in particular. Uh, Nan and I went over uh, a while back, we went over to Lego World. Boys and girls, you ever been to Lego World? It's the coolest place on the planet. You walk into the lobby of Lego World and there is this life-size statue of Dirk, uh, Dirk Nowinski of the Dallas Mavericks, seven feet tall, thousands and thousands of little Legos all making up this statue of Dirk. Now, I'm not skilled enough and not uh, knowledgeable enough to be able to handle Legos at that level, but I can handle this level. 
uh, the level of our little preschoolers. This is, these are the Lego blocks that they use. And I want you to think about uh, the, the building blocks for raising children that will, that will know and follow the way and the path of God. Here's the first building block. That is biblical instruction. Biblical instruction. Now, we've been talking about that and singing about that already today. But the greatest parenting tool that we have at our disposal is the word of the Lord. And we never should forget that, that the word of God is sufficient. In fact, the Apostle Paul was, was writing to, uh, uh, to his young partner in ministry, Timothy, about the power and the sufficiency of the Word of God. It contains everything we need for life, including in how to raise our kids. For instance, 2 Timothy, 1, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15 talks about, gives us everything we need to know about salvation. It says, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures. How did he know from infancy the Holy Scriptures? Someone taught him the Holy Scriptures. We're going to see in just a moment, it was his grandmother and his mother. From infancy, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. So when you, when you teach your children the Word of God, you're teaching them the gospel. The gospel, again, is that our greatest problem is our sin. And our greatest enemy is death that comes because of that sin. But Jesus came to redeem us. He came to rescue us. He lived and died and rose again so that we could have eternal life. And so the Word of God shows us what we need to know about salvation. The Word of God shows us what our children need to know about sanctification. It goes on to say in verse 16 that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So here's the way it works. That the Word of God when it's planted into our lives, first of all, teaches us the path, the way that we're to go. Then when we get off of that path, and we will sooner or later get off of that path, the Word of God then rebukes us and tells us, you're on, you're on the wrong path. But it does more than that. It corrects us. It turns us back toward the way of God. And then it trains us to stay on the way of God. And so the Word of God is sufficient to show us what we need to know about salvation, but to show our kids also what they need to know about sanctification. And it also is sufficient for what we need to know about service, about serving God. Verse 17 goes on to say, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Isn't that what we want for our kids and our grandkids? We want them to be equipped to do the good work that God has created for them to live and to live out in their lives in every realm. And so the Word of God is sufficient to help our children know about salvation and sanctification and service to God. Now, the second building block is this, consistent discipline. Consistent discipline. And... Um, you know, discipline takes many forms, as you know. Sometimes discipline takes the form of verbal correction. When your child uh, disobeys or misbehaves, disobeys the, the, the word of the Lord or some rule in the family, that typically our first discipline is verbal correction. Wait a minute, that's wrong. Don't want you doing that anymore. But on the other side of that, they need just as much, if not more, verbal affirmation. You see, that's a form of correction. That's a form of discipline as well, is verbal affirmation. Many kids, all they ever hear is when they go wrong, when they've messed up. They need to hear as much, if not more, when they've done it right, because that's the way that behavior is reinforced, is when we, when we affirm them when they, when they do the right thing. And then when verbal forms of correction don't get their attention, sometimes punishment is necessary. Now, this is typically the, when we think of discipline, we think of punishment. But it, as you see, it's just a small part of it, but it's, it's important. might mean taking the toys away from them for a while, uh, taking certain privileges away from them for a while. And yes, sometimes when they're very small, physical punishment 
is, is necessary. The Bible is not opposed to physical punishment as long as it is administered with love. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Notice that the connection there between discipline and love, punishment and love. Now, when our girls were little and still learning how to behave properly, uh, we would use a, um, a little wooden spoon to swat them when other forms of correction didn't get their attention. And so uh, Nan carried that wooden spoon in her purse. <laughs> and when we went out in public and the girls misbehaved and the look didn't work, any of you remember the look? <clears throat> well, I can still remember my dad's look. I mean, he could wilt me from across the room. But when that didn't work, all Nan had to do is just to slide just a part of that spoon out <laughs> of the purse. And the kids, they, they got the message. But notice again that this kind of discipline is, is tempered with, with love. If all our children get is punishment when they do wrong, they never hear affirmation, then, then this kind of discipline will not be effective because what it'll do is just make them more frustrated when all they hear, they can never do anything right. But when this kind of correction is, is given in, a, in the context of a loving relationship, it actually gives our kids a greater sense of security. They know that there are some boundaries in which they, they can live and be safe. Children that have no discipline are not happy children. They're insecure children. And so it's important that we give consistent discipline. Then there is a third building block, and that is the building block of unconditional love, as I said. The proverb says that if you, you, know, if, if, if you, you love your children, you're going to discipline them. But, but it's so important that discipline be administered in a context of unconditional love. And there are three ways, typically, that this love can be communicated. First of all, through, uh, through time. Through time, spending time with your kids. Quality of time, quantity of time. But also, it's communicated, unconditional love is communicated through telling. Just telling your kids that you love them. And don't underestimate how powerful that is to look them squarely in the face and say, I love you. And to say it often. You know, sometimes we think, well, it doesn't mean anything if I say it all the time. No. Say it often. I love you, son. I love you, daughter. So time, telling, and touch. Touch. That is through physical affection we communicate unconditional love. This is so important for children. Science has proven this over and over again that babies that grow up, that start off with that kind of physical touch, physical affection, develop in the most healthy way. And so we communicate unconditional love. That's the third building block. But all of this is leading toward another building block in raising children who will stay on the path of the Lord, and that is a heart connection. A heart connection. You see, all of this is building when we give our children biblical instruction, consistent discipline, and unconditional love, what we're wanting to do is to establish a heart connection with them. Proverbs 23, 26 says, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes keep to my ways. So we're talking here about establishing an emotional connection with our kids to where we're not just telling them the right thing to do, that we're pouring our whole being into that child to where they know that this is more than just words that are coming out of our mouth, that this is our heart that we're conveying to them. That's why the psalm is, why the proverb says, give me your heart, because that's when the change, that's when the connection, emotional engagement with our children is so important. 
And you can do all of these things, but if they don't know it's coming from your heart, that you love them, then it will not be effective. And that leads to the next thing. The the, the proverb says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes keep to my ways. The next building block is a positive example. Let's use a green one. A positive example. Notice all of these are connected together. You don't use one independent of the other. They're all connected together. A positive example. Solomon says, son, watch me. Watch me. Watch the way I live. And, uh, and there's a great illustration of this, again, in the New Testament, where Paul was, was giving counsel to his young partner in ministry, Timothy, about the, uh, about the importance of, of standing strong in the faith that is passed to him. 2 Timothy 1.5 says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. You see the importance of this? Paul says, Timothy, I see the sincere faith that you have, and I know that, that, that it was passed on to you by the example of your grandmother and your mother. The faith first lived in them. I love that. Listen, we are either going to pass on to our children a living faith or a dead faith. A dead faith is all words, all lectures. A living faith is a faith that they see lived out in you. A love for Jesus that just exudes from every pore of your being. Not that you're perfect. None of us ever can be. But they know your heart. They know that your love for Jesus drives everything that you do. That's the kind of faith, that's the kind of example that we want to pass along to our children. Our children are watching us. They're looking, they're listening, they're learning. Never underestimate that. They're looking, they're listening, and they're learning. Are they learning good or bad from us? And then the last building block of wise parenting that I want to share with you today is persevering prayer. Persevering prayer. You know, I think about the many times that people brought their children to Jesus. In the New Testament, time and time again, we see parents bringing their children to Jesus, coming to Jesus in behalf of their child. On one occasion, Mark chapter 5 There was a man by the name of Jairus whose daughter was deathly ill. And the Bible says that he ran to Jesus and and fell at his feet. And Mark 5, 23 says, and pleaded earnestly with him. When is the last time you pleaded earnestly for your kids or your grandkids? The other children in your life pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Listen, there are many things that we cannot do for our kids. Perhaps the most important things we cannot do for them. And that's why it is so important for us to lay hold of the resources of God for our children through persevering, prevailing prayer. It's one of the most important things that we do. We we, we pray with our kids. We teach them to pray. And we pray for our kids. We pray for their salvation. We pray for their protection. We pray for their wisdom. We pray for the influences that come around them. We pray for good and godly influences, for them to be shielded and protected from from evil influences that come to them at school or anywhere else. We pray for their future mates. We pray for their choices and the decisions that they will make. We pray for their forgiveness. We pray for their restoration when they get off of the path that God has called them to take. And I'm going to tell you something. We, Nan and I, prayed with and over our children from the very earliest days, and we thought we were praying hard, but I want to tell you something. Praying for adult children is even more critical because the stakes are higher. 
That's one of the great ministries of grandparents is to be prayer warriors for your kids and for your, for your grandkids. So if we train up a child in this way with biblical instruction, with consistent discipline and unconditional love and a heart connection and a positive example and persevering prayer, this is what we can expect God to do. We can trust God to guard our kids and to guide them and to grow them and to give them grace. We can trust God that when they get off of the path, and every child will sooner or later, they're going to get off of the path. We can trust that God will speak to them, that they're going to hear the voice of God of Isaiah 40, uh, 30, verse 21, that says whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the way. Walk in it. I'm just impressed today that we need to pray for our kids and our grandkids and the children of our church. I, I would like for us just to end our service in this way. Moms and dads, maybe you would just like to come to this altar. Grandparents, you would want to come to this altar. Or maybe you would just like to circle up with your kids right where you're seated there and pray over them. Just put your hands on them and pray for them. Oh, how desperately. You know, the Bible says no weapon formed against you will prosper. And I'm telling you, church, there are weapons being formed against our children. And we need, to, we need to hold up the shield of faith over our families and over our kids and our grandkids for the onslaught of evil that they're going to have to face. But we want to teach them not to shrink back in fear, but to be bold and courageous in the face of this rising tide of evil so that they will be leaders in their generation. That's the kind of kids we want. So church, I want us just to go to prayer now. Some of you would want to come to the altar here and just... Just pray and kneel in behalf of your kids or your grandkids, or maybe you just want to pray right where you're seated there. Just, let's just go to prayer as the, as the pianist begins to play. Let's, let's just go to prayer right now. Come right on right now. Moms, dads, grandparents, even single adults, you can have a ministry here in helping us pray for the children of our church. Let's just bow our hearts and our heads together. Right where you are, maybe dad, mom, you want to just put your arms around your kids and just pray for them right there. Seated in your seat. Your child, maybe. Your heart is broken today because your child is far from God. And right where you are, you just want to cry out to God. God God's reach is, lim is, is unlimited. Man, his arms are long. And sitting right here, praying in Fort Worth, Texas, for a child in another state. Don't be surprised what God can do. Let's pray.
Father, in our family of faith here, Travis, we have precious boys and girls, students, who are in the formative years of their life. And Lord, we want them to get started on your way, on your path, Lord, so that all of the days of their life they will honor and serve and glorify and love you. And God, we're praying not for just little good boys and girls. We are praying for an army of mighty men and women of faith. God, we're praying for for girls who will become godly women who will lead their homes and maybe take their place somewhere else in the marketplace as a dynamic witness for you. We pray for boys who will grow to be warriors for Christ, mighty men of God. Lord, who will will stand strong for Jesus when the pressure is great. Lord, I pray for our city and I pray for our nation. We're in a mess. We're calling right wrong and we're calling wrong right. Lord, forgive us. And I pray that we will be everything we should be as salt and light in our our city, in our schools, wherever you place us, Lord, with kindness, but with boldness to say the ways of God are always right. No matter how we feel about it or what our leaders say about it. And so, God... Move in our land. I pray for a spiritual awakening that will turn us back, Lord, to the values of the Word of God. Lord, an election coming up here in a few months once again will chart the course for the future. And Lord, we pray that you will give us leaders who are wise, wise men and women. And Lord, that our nation would turn back to you. Let it start in us, we ask in Jesus' name.